утро, коллеги. Меня зовут Анастасия Александрович. Александрович. I represent Belarusian Press Club, and today we'll have a presentation of the new survey of Andrei Petrovich Fordamatsky, the sociologist. Today we have a um, hybrid format, uh, online in Zoom and uh, offline in Warsaw, in media board. This presentation will have three parts. The first part will be the presentation of Andre. Uh, the second part uh, will be questions from the participants. You can write it on the chat or you can raise your hands and ask your question. And the third part is a bonus for those staying in Warsaw. We can communicate, drink coffee with Andre. And uh, now I give the floor to Andre. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for invitation. Today we will talk about the response of uh, the Belarusian public to uh, the events, uh, which we can call kind of critical events, and this is the war in Ukraine. This is quite an unusual, not some routine monitoring survey, of course, because we measure the response to an event which, uh, thank God, happens only very rarely, maybe once uh, in a lifetime of a person. I will now list the main uh, thesis, which I'd like to present to you. I hope it will take not more than 25 minutes. So, there was a question asked uh, about the so-called period of the field or period of the survey. Uh, this period was from the 15th of March till the 26th of March 2022, and this refers to all the slides I'm going to present. So, this is uh, one month after the war started. And uh, some more technical parameters. So, the sampling size was 1,000 respondents. This is the standard size, which is relevant, which is enough to measure the public opinion in Belarus. Uh, the period of the survey was from 15th uh, till 26th of March, and the survey was done by phone, via phone calls. So this slide represents the formula of the situation in general, as it is, and in particular of the public opinion in the country. I mean here two things. Uh, on the slide is stated, silence is uh, means non-concern. Uh, the first thing is uh, the general attitude to the regime, and the second thing is the response to the war, to the war actions, and the, to the consequences for Belarus. And uh, this uh, silence is not absolute currently, Actually, so the second uh, thing uh, which you will see based on a list, a uh, number of indicators that I'm going to present, this is the echo or introduction of the so called Russian world into our society. And here I primarily mean uh, the influence of the media and uh, this also is reflected in the estimates of the Belarusian public opinion. That's connected primarily with the uh, very well-known fact. And uh, I mean the narratives presented by the Belarusian media, state media, and uh, uh, the Russian media. Uh, they present more or less the same narratives. 
However, they exist in two different uh, media environments. So, the geopolitical orientations. This is an issue which is naturally connected to the tough events that occur now. And the Russian experts, they had some thoughts, some focus on how the Belarusian geopolitical orientation changed as a consequence of this action. So the focus was different from how it actually uh, happened. And my measurements, my survey shows that. I will explain it to you a little later. So the first informational module. So the attitude to the army, Russian, Belarusian army, in the uh, different forms. So there are kind of three forms of this attitude. So the first, uh, placement of Belarusian army in Belarus. What's your attitude to the fact that um, the Russian army was placed in Belarus? And here we see that we can observe kind of a classical split of the public opinion. I mean, negative and positive values are more or less uh, equal, with some shift towards negative attitude. We cannot see the figures, actually. I don't know why. Can we see it on the big screen, no? No. Well, okay. That means there was some uh, problem with the conversion. But uh, I think you more or less understand what I mean here. It's around 40-45% um, falls with both positive and negative attitude. There is a little bit shift towards the negative attitude and you see two lines blue and red line uh, blue line is so-called weighted value and the uh, red is non-weighted value the more correct value is the blue one because this is weighted i mean weighted is the one which more complies with the social and demographic proportions existing in the society in general, um, in the age group above 18 years old. And this weighting is done based on the latest statistical data, uh, latest census data, etc. So, both values I present on purpose because that's intended to show the difference between these two values. This is kind of, uh, kind of an experiment uh, to show you how we actually calculate the values. So first we get the raw data, which is the red line, and then we calculate the weighted value uh, based on the social and demographic proportions of the society. So the second point, small question, to specify uh, about the previous slide. It includes both men and women, right? Yes, uh, this includes both. This is a so-called direct or linear calculation, uh, which is based on the whole sampling size of the whole population uh, of these 1,000 respondents. And then we can make more specific calculations uh, in different groups, uh, education, gender, uh, age, etc., etc. I will show you a little bit later how the two-dimensional distribution is done, and uh, I will show you it in the section where it is of some interest. Okay, so here the second question: um, How do you? What was your um, attitude to use of territory and military infrastructure in Belarus? And uh, here there are more negative answers then with the previous one 
Yes, this is the value 20 plus uh, almost 30. And uh, here um, we can also say that this is the period of structural indicators. Here I mean that these indicators, kind of military indicators, they reproduce the political structure of the Belarusian society as a whole. So without knowing this structure, we can uh, understand what it is like based on these military indicators. And the last, the most sensitive question, what's your attitude uh, to possible participation of Belarusian army in the war actions in Ukraine. And here the dominance uh, is negative attitude. There are some positive responses. So we cannot see the figure, so, but it's 11%. So one in 10 Russians um, has a positive attitude to that. So three way attitude all three levels of attitude to various actions to be taken by the army. So we have split and dominant. So split is, I mean, the fact of placement of the army, Russian army in Belarus, the second one, two-thirds are against it. So this is the use of the territory and military infrastructure of Belarus for military actions inside Belarus. Uh, and uh, the third one is the possible entry of Belarusian army to Ukraine to participate in the war. So this is the basic figure and if you like this is the main slide of this presentation of this material. So, here you had a question regarding whether we covered the whole population or not. But if we divide based on the education and attitude to possible participation of the Belarusian army, here we see quite a direct link of this attitude to the level of education. The higher is the education, you see, yeah, like on complete uh, secondary, vocational, and higher. So the higher is the education, the lower is the support of potential participation of the Belarusian army in the war in Ukraine. So we can see quite clearly, visually, this line dependence. And the second factor connected with this two-dimensional distribution, the rationality. So, what's your attitude to entry or participation of uh, the Belarusian army? And the red lines mean that among Belarusians who identify themselves with uh, the Belarusian nation, the level of support although this is a very small percentage, is lower than among other national groups. So we can see it here. Well, this is quite a rare, I would say, unique situation when national parameter is a differentiating factor. So, Normally, this can be uh, based on the political orientation, etc. But here is quite a rare situation when it is. So, a small technical problem is resolved. Now we can see the figures and I'm getting back to the main, as I think, slide this presentation, which is the attitude to possible participation of the Russian army in the war in Ukraine. So 
as we see the positive attitude is with 11 percent of respondents citizens of the Republic of Belarus the age group 18 plus so one in 10 people has this positive attitude and uh, we have three levels of attitude to the army the opinions split I mean um, the opinion about the placement of the Russian army in Belarus two-thirds are against of using the Belarusian territory for that and almost everyone is against of using the Belarusian army for war actions military actions in Ukraine also I'd like to draw attention to the distribution social groups. The most important factor here is education. And you see the red line of those who approve of uh, the Belarusian army participation. And we see that the number of those who support decline as their education uh, grows, like get, gets higher. And uh, this is the quite clear line of dependence. And the second parameter, which seemed interesting to me, is the national parameter. So among Belarusians who identify themselves with the Belarusian nation, we have 9.9% of those. And um, representatives of other uh, nationalities uh, mixed two times more respondents support participation of the Russian army, 21%. This is a very rare situation when the national parameter really works. Normally this national identity doesn't actually affect uh, the political ratings or anything like that. Normally it doesn't work, but here it really does. This is a kind of unique situation. Let's go on. What is summary of what I've said on this parameter? And uh, the second module uh, is about union orientations. Belarusians uh, predominantly are oriented at out of block status, and this uh, reflects the geopolitical orientation of Belarusians. So the question was in which uh, military or political union uh, Belarus should be a party and uh, most of respondents replied in none. So more than half of respondents don't want to join any unions. So uh, about 5% want to be uh, part of uh, NATO, and this is a constant uh, factor in the Belarusian mentality. Um, so, uh, starting from 1990s, we had two constants in Belarusian mentality. Uh, the first one is uh, to join the Russian Federation as an entity, uh, in purely legally sense. It, it's normally supported by three to five percent, and the uh, attitude to NATO is also uh, the constant, as opposed to Poland, where up to eighty percent want to be members of NATO. In Belarus, it's much lower, and in Poland, it grew in two thousand fourteen by twenty percent approximately by the same value as in Russia, the Putin's rating grew. So this is quite interesting. So the second line uh, is that 30% um, want to join CSTO also. Yeah. And uh, the traditional philosophical and the sociological question is who is to blame for 
for the war, which uh, outbroke on 24th of February 22. So mostly people think that this is Russia, this is the first position, and you see that 24 or 30 percent, depending on whether it's weighted or non-weighted data used. So each uh, fourth or even each third uh, Belarusian assumes that Russia started this war, actually. And uh, this is the first position, however, but this is not 50 or 60 percent, right? This is not the um, predominant opinion. And you see that US is the uh, second, is the next after Russia. Also, quite a lot of people think that they are to blame for the war. So each fifth of uh, Belarusians thinks so. So the difference between these two countries is not that big. Uh, Ukraine from 13 to 17 percent. NATO 11 percent. Uh, both parties are to blame uh, from 3 to 6 percent. So we see that Russia, yes, it occupies the first position, but on the other hand, this is not the uh, dominant opinion from the point of view of uh, the kind of majority of population of respondents and the US also occupies the second position and here the motivational complex which is behind that is quite big but we can separate out two factors first this is not the, basically only the the media echo of the Russian world but because uh, this interpretation might um, come to our mind as the first explanation to this, but I think uh, mostly there is uh, another motivation, is, uh, which is absence of uh, rapid response or existence of any structured response of US to the war or to the possible onset of the war. So this is the assessment of uh, not enough response from the US to this event, actually. And also, this is also the bombing of uh, Iraq, Yugoslavia and others, which uh, are the basis of this uh, figure. So, how do you uh, come to this um, result? B based on uh, the service, on the analysis, it is not that I'm just coming up with uh, without any basis for that. No. Well, I just specify why do you think U.S. is responsible for uh, that. I mean, uh, did you ask this question at all? Yes, we have a kind of a survey complex of questions, and this is part of uh, this question. So we have to assess both quality and quantity, and uh, we made a quality survey. And that's why we had to use it. Inside this um, questionnaire, this question was not asked as a separate question about the US. Unfortunately, it's quite hard to hear the speaker. Well, in general, if we look at so, the Belarusians are quite advanced because uh, Belarus is the third intellectual point 
I mean, uh, it occupies the third position uh, as the place with the highest intellectual capacity uh, in the ex USSR. I mean, in, only in Minsk we have uh, 33 academic institutions, and this is the final stage of the kind of uh, all Soviet uh, assembly workshop, and that requires quite a high literacy, scientific literacy. And, uh, that always uh, was a feature of Belarus, that they were kind of smart, high level of professionalism, and professional skills, abilities, etc. And correspondingly, the analytical skills of Belarusians are quite developed. Same as good roads was always a feature of Belarus, and this is not something that happened uh, during some recent time, so it was, it's been forming for years, for many years. This, I mean, the ability of Belarusians to do some critical analysis of various facts and figures, situations, etc. So we have a question from the chat about this slide. What was the motivation to blame uh, the Ukraine, Ukraine uh, in war. I mean, uh, what is the motivation? They say that this is uh, the Bandera military troops or neo nazist uh, drug addicts, these uh, terrible guys who support the West. I mean, the Western part of Ukraine, uh, the terrible government which occupied Ukraine, uh, which came to power via few data. And uh, I'm just citing to you the motivational complex, I mean the motivational factors, which are the basis of uh, the opinion of these people. And uh, this is uh, really exists. And uh, I don't know whether it's big or small, but it exists there. This is the segment of the public opinion, and uh, it's there. You all know all of them from uh, the statements by some of you. They really work, and we have to take a sober attitude to that. Kind of reasonable attitude to that. We have to understand that it exists. Uh, next question uh, Do you approve of the actions of Russia in the current war conflict? And here, I don't approve of that, uh, more than 50%. And I'd like to make a very interesting comparison that the level of non approval of Russia is two times higher uh, than the level of uh, uh, blaming. For the war. I mean, uh, people, 25% of Belarusians blame uh, Russia for starting the war. It's 25-27%. But their actions, uh, here the disapproval is two times higher, almost two times higher. And I just uh, explain <coughs> this difference. So, I mean, the assessment of the uh, start of the war is uh, less negative and uh, the disapproval of the actions taken by Russia and Ukraine is uh, two times more negative. So, uh, participation of Belarus in the war conflict in Ukraine, do you think that Belarus is also participating in this war? So, uh, two-thirds of Belarusians think that Belarus does not participate in this conflict. They don't feel that they participate in this war conflict in Ukraine. And here we also can elaborate on the motivation. And it mainly is that most of the population doesn't have the feeling that the war is going at all. Because where is the war? We just passed through... Okay, we've seen some military vehicles at slow speed. Uh, they passed by and uh, they're gone. So people don't think that there is a war somewhere, and uh, only very small information is coming from the mass media. That's why most people 
think that there is kind of no war, or there is no feeling of war going on. So sympathy, which party of the conflict do you sympathize more? And here uh, the Irki is different, it's opposite to the question who is to blame for, because uh, there the Ukraine was uh, at the bottom, and here Ukraine is the dominant. This is the party with which mostly people sympathize emotionally. So the Russia, with the Russia sympathize only 20%. So the next, um, Lugansk and Donetsk uh, People's Republic. Uh, do you support recognition of uh, these two republics by Russia and by Belarusian uh, government? So regarding recognition by Russia, negative attitude was expressed by 33% one-third of respondents, positive, it was half and even a little more. So this is also the indicator which shows that the media flows, media interpretations of this narrative, uh, which is uh, presented by the mass media, it really works. So the recognition of Lugansk and Donetsk um, People's Republic by the government of Belarus. So the picture here is different. Uh, it's uh, more negative. Almost um, uh, half of respondents expressed a negative attitude to that. The general assessment of how people assess their own level of awareness of what is going on in Ukraine now. And uh, here you see that four kids think that they are very well aware of what's happening in Ukraine, although under the conditions when Belarusian official narrative coincides with the Russian official narrative, it's hard to say that the awareness is there. But people feel that they are really very well aware of what's going on. That's why I call it the paradox of media uh, subjectivity. This is just my interpretation. And uh, here we talk about the basic geopolitical choice uh, regarding what I've said at the beginning. So these are the forecasts. They did not coincide with the processes um, in the public opinion that actually uh, occurred. So, I mean, uh, the traditional question that is normally asked for 20, 25 years, so in which, by your opinion, would be better to live for people of Belarus? In which uh, union? In the European Union or in union with Russia? The red line is uh, the union with Russia, the blue line is the European Union. And Based on the non-weighted data, the last uh, point, measurement point, which was measured during this survey period from 15th till 26th of March, so uh, this orientation at Russia decreased a little bit from 43 to 40%, um, and uh, the number of people who want to join the European Union increased a little bit. But uh, this is uh, based on not weighted data. But if we look at weighted data, the picture is different, completely different. Al although uh, the figures, they are almost the same, but the qualitative characteristic of the process is different. This is not 
joining of orientation as it was or divergence of orientation uh, to Russia and to Europe by quantity but this is a completely different attitude so people uh, get more oriented both to joining European Union and to union with Russia this is the crystallization because the number of those uh, who do not support both unions decrease. So this gray line, those who don't support any union, uh, they, it goes down, you see? And uh, people from that group, they join both supporters of European Union and Russian Union. So this is one of the theoretical schemes or options or dynamical schemes, how the changes, geopolitical changes uh, can happen in these situations uh, so it can be a decrease of those who support russian union but also at the same time in parallel to that you can observe crystallization of multi-directional development of the public opinion and uh, each of this opinion can accumulate some energy and uh, become stronger. So people who have some political position, some attitude, number of these people grow and the number of those who don't have this position uh, goes down. So this is the process uh, which is possible and which is actually happening now. So something went wrong, uh, not as the expert predicted, both in Belarus and in at the international level. So they forecast that the number of people who want to join Russia will decrease, but it was wrong. Uh, so what can happen next? How can we forecast the future dynamics of this basic geopolitical indicator? So the first is polarization. So each of the orientations might have its own crystallized orientation. So I introduced this term a couple of months ago. There will be more of both supporters of EU and uh, of Russia. This is one possible trend. The second possible trend is the partial split, which is uh, which means that, uh, sorry, not uh, split, but kind of separation or kind of split off or break away. So there will be some people supporting some uh, specific uh, actions uh, in foreign or negative or, or um, domestic policy of Russia and uh, some there will be some people who negatively assess some specific actions of Russia in the foreign policy and domestic policy and when it accumulates when too many people disapprove of some specific actions then the general trend will go down and uh, the third option is that uh, the general public opinion will move towards Europe, Europe uh, move out uh, side of Russia. So it will is a proof of Russia, but it will not uh, lead to increase of number of people who would like to join Europe. The question is, uh, maybe you think that uh, so people, many people supporting Russia is kind of recognition of our uh, inability to do anything and is this kind of a fear and we want to just to join some strong force. Well, I cannot uh, say whether it is this, like this or it is not. I can just state uh, the results of the analysis of uh, the processes existing now. So there are some outside processes which affect Belarus, which is the war in Ukraine, which by itself restructures G 
geopolitical orientation. One of the options is that there can be a downward trend. I mean, less people will support Russia. The second option is that uh, the number of supporters of both EU and Russia will grow simultaneously. And the second social reality is the media input or media influence, which uh, I listed as one of the main theses at the beginning. So the media echo of the Russian world. So that's what actually is happening. And that's somehow affects people. And that's why we can suppose that the people who are currently oriented at Russia, who support Russia, they will also solidify their position. They will be even more supporting Russia than earlier. And also with some time lag, there can be the effect of people starting to analyze and uh, analyze and express some critical attitude to information coming from the media. And then uh, the number of people supporting Russia might sharply go down because of some specific actions or situations uh, which can, will be negatively assessed. So do you think this is the typical behavior of Belarus, of, I mean, this geopolitical orientation? So Belarusians, as it was stated in March, uh, we've seen the uh, interest to EU is going down and the supporters of Russia are growing. And at the other slide, we've seen that a lot of Belarusians are interested in not joining any union or bloc. And so I think um, Belarusians, they consider it to be quite dangerous to express interest to you. Maybe this is the reason. So you'd like to find some contradiction in the public opinion of Belarusians. Well, you shouldn't look for those because the public, the basic characteristic of public opinion at such historical stages of society development is that it's contradictory by nature. This is just, there, there are a huge number of examples when these things contradict. You can ask a person, do you support the market economy? And a person responding to sincerely answer, sincerely, yes, I support it. And to the next question, which is asked just five seconds after the first one, you will ask, does the state have to subsidize uh, the collective farms, enterprises, etc. And uh, this same person uh, will answer, yes, it should subsidize the state enterprises. And uh, these are two contradictory answers. We can give you many examples like that. So, and in this situation, when there is a lot of stability, a lot of changes, so contradictory is one of the main features of that. And it's prayer Presupposed by the fact that there are all schemes of the collective conscious, which is non contradictory, and there is a new conscious. And these new components of the conscious, they kind of overact the old ones, they destroy them, or they destroy part of them, but they cannot create this new system without any contradictions, etc. So you cannot demand from the public conscious that it has some uh, intellectual fineness or something. So, I mean, like a car has uh, four wheels and the same as this uh, rule, the public conscious at this stage of society development should have this contradictory uh, nature. And the uh, next thing um, is that uh, your question was about this basic geopolitical orientations. And here I can answer you with one example. At the, uh, at the border between 2006 and 2007, I mean, around this time, there were so-called hydrocarbon events, I call them. It was a sharp change, steep change of prices for the Russian energy carriers. Uh, and uh, within a month, the public opinion 
uh, fell by 10 percent. I mean, uh, the number of Russian supporters uh, decreased by 10 percent. It's kind of tectonic uh, shift which is not possible. It's a very rigid structure, it's a uh, uh, train which you cannot move by hand, but it just happened, it's an empirical fact. It took only one month uh, to reach this decrease of 10 percent. Why? And what is the difference from the current situation? That happened because the next day after this purely economic um, phenomenon, a change of prices, uh, they got higher for hydrocarbons. So there was a massive media campaign started, started by the government and the public opinion, uh, which is uh, media dependent structure or organism responded to it very quickly. And what is interesting, purely from the economic point of view, uh, same happened uh, in Ukraine approximately at the same time, also the prices changed, but the response of the mass conscious it was not observed in Ukraine, they didn't change their geopolitical orientation, but it did in Belarus. So why? Because there was no intensive media campaign in Ukraine, uh, but it was in, in Belarus. That's why this difference was observed. So this is not kind of a change of basic geopolitical conscious or orientation. And it uh, didn't happen now, after the war has started, because the narrative of Belarusian media and Russian media was the same. It coincided with the Russian and it kind of uh, suppressed the negative attitude to the war. That's how it happens. That's how the media dependency of the public opinion can be revealed. So, I was asked how the war affect the Belarusian mentality. The specific answer would be like that. It doesn't affect the Belarusian mentality. The war itself does not affect it, but what affects it is the media construct which uh, enters the minds of people. And uh, how to put it in another way, when I uh, hold my lectures uh, to the students, I normally started with a question, what the sociological values or results mean for us? By themselves, they mean nothing to us, only the interpretation of these figures, results, uh, means something to us. Hope I answered the question. So we have more questions about the slide. slides. Uh, so judging from the slides, the trend for consolidation of uh, Belarus with the Russian duration is there, right? This trend exists. Do you agree? Well, I think a uh, more adequate term to describe the dynamic of geopolitical orientation, basic geopolitical orientation in Belarus is a kind of a fork. And I can, uh, we can interpret in a different way. So, for example, uh, there are two roads to go and uh, the public uh, conscious stands in front of this fork and also we didn't have uh, I didn't talk about this time lag uh, between the something happening, actually an event, and the response of the public opinion to that. The expert who found out some fact at 12 o'clock in the night and uh, it will take him just five minutes to wake up, to start writing something, and this is the response to what has happened. For the public conscious it's different. There is quite a big time lag between the 
events or the media flow uh, incoming and uh, the response to this, especially in such a situation, for example. It, so, for example, some people don't really understand um, at first that the war has started, although the Belarusians living in the Western media environment they get this information about that every minute. But most of other people, they don't get this information. And that's why we observe this time lag between the event and the response. So the understanding of what has happened, it comes after a while, which is very different from the response of an expert to an event or to something happening. So this is the media component. So I have to thank Andrei uh, Kazakevich for participating in media part. So uh, thank you, Andrei, for that. So you see here. Uh, so the question was that. So which channels were most uh, useful for you uh, to get information about the events in Ukraine? Telegram on the first position, YouTube on the third position, and the State TV of Belarus uh, on the third place. So uh, this is the officially this is this third place. So if we see that the state-owned TV is different, however, it's like not far behind. The ranking is like that, but IRQ of ratings is different. I mean, ranking is like Telegram first position, YouTube second, state TV third position, one, two, three, but IRQ of ratings or rankings is not one to three it's more like like sportsman sometimes they sometimes we have two uh, people on the first place and uh, uh, one or two persons on the second place this is possible in sport and it's possible uh, in this analysis as well so the, what I mean is that a lot of people, they really value opinion of the Belarusian TV. So some people say that uh, TV is not, does not count anymore, it's gone, but this is a romantic uh, opinion of experts or students, but it's not uh, correct. I remember very well that once I tried to make in a student's work group to, to make a survey uh, about TV and I gave them questionnaires and they were looking at me asking what it is. I tried to ask, you don't understand something uh, I will explain to you. Uh, but uh, then I found out that these people just don't watch TV at all. Yes, there are some categories of population which don't watch TV, but there is the other category or there is the other part of society which really watches TV a lot, and the weight of uh, questionnaire or voting for voting. I mean, uh, of an old woman who never reads anything but just watches TV. I mean, the weight of this voting will be the same uh, as of an advanced expert who only yesterday defended the thesis uh, for their doctor of philosophy status uh, or wrote a book or whatever. So this is quite a very serious uh, factor which I'd like to draw your attention to. And also, especially within the context of the fact that the Belarusian narrative Belarusian TV narrative coincides with the Russian TV narrative, and this is the reason of the results, I mean, of the figures that we get there, here. 
довольно общий вопрос. Он so I have quite a general question, and uh, I have it uh, from the very beginning of the presentation. So, do you really think that the Belarusian and Russian narratives fully coincide? I think they are not fully, they not fully coincide. Of course, both of them. Um, approve of the war in Ukraine, but there is no uh, imperial attitude, also this narrative about fascists, neo-Nazis, etc. So, some things are quite different. I don't know whether it affects the public opinion, because if uh, for some people uh, the main uh, source of information is um, the TV, then it can also affect the mentality or opinion of people. So, actually, we can ask another expert who maybe studies these um, things by different methods, including the method of content analysis, uh, the narrative of the media, and he will say, it seems to me, you know, it seems to you that it doesn't coincide. And another expert would say, and it seems to me that it fully coincides. So I tried, I tried to answer your question in this way. So it's we don't need to be based on our feelings, but we have to be based more like on specific figures and facts. So we do daily monitoring of Russian propaganda. So this is the result of analysis. For example, we don't have Mr. Solovyov on Belarusian TV. Uh, we don't have it. And uh, also the terminology used by Russian TV is different. And uh, Azarionok is not that popular as Solovyov. Well, it's quite popular. So maybe there is uh, Igor Turi uh, and five, six um, viewers, a thousand viewers are there, but uh, this is YouTube, it's a specialized audience. So, uh, also we have the yellow arms and uh, I think it very much coincides with all of your position and what he is actually doing. So, I didn't do the content analysis actually uh, on the subject that you mentioned, but I know that I know the results of the service of experts service which stated like coincide. Some experts say that these narratives coincide. Maybe that nothing coincides fully, I mean completely. There is always some difference. But this difference might be small or big. So 10% is it big or small difference? 10% of people who like uh, cherry Coca-Cola is not much as compared to the whole audience, target audience of Coca-Cola, but 10% who are ready to go as volunteers and to participate in some war, it's a huge number. I don't say that we have some 10% here in this survey, but I mean 10% can be a lot and it can be almost nothing. So, actually, I've seen the service which stated that uh, these narratives coincide. So, we would like just to find out how much does it coincide. 
I mean, it coincides in terms of digital parameters. And LRQ website presents very good monthly report, which gives a lot of data on that. So the Pikanov wants to join us. So I think it takes only a couple of seconds. Well, colleagues, I'd like to uh, argue a little bit with Oleg Petrovich uh, about the fact that it coincides. Of course, if you analyze only Telegram channels, it more coincides rather than, rather than don't coincide, because the information in the yellow plums is completely different from what is shown on TV. If we even quickly look through the news on STV or NTR, so you will see that it's not that tough, you know? I mean, it's not that sharp. Okay, the general narrative is uh, uh, same. Uh, some people talk about na Nazis in Ukraine, about support to Russian Federation, but uh, in Olte still is not that heated. Uh, they are mainly talking about something different. They're not talking about war in Ukraine all the time. So I don't think this narrative coincide basically. They, in Telegram uh, channels, they coincide much more because the audience of Yellow Plums is different from the Onte and STV audience. So that's why we have to be more accurate about that because it's very, very different. Well, I think that we have to be more careful with the words, it seems to me. It seems to me yeah, that we have to be more careful with these words. Well, this is my remark about that, but of course we can talk about that and uh, think about that. And, uh, we can specify responding to what you said uh, we can say that currently it coincides more than earlier a year ago for example or let's say during the uh, period of so-called Russian uh, soul, snow break. Now it coincides more. So, colleagues, do you want to ask uh, questions about the presentation in general or about this part? Okay, if you want to ask about this part, then first, Andrei. Yeah, so my question is about, uh, about this presentation in general. Okay, let's wait till the end. And only then we can talk about the presentation in general. My question uh, is about the presentation in general, so let's wait till the end. Okay, basically I've shown this uh, media part. We are uh, actually close to the end of the presentation. And the last, uh, maybe not that beautiful slide, but this is the slide about the economic um, assessment of the Russians of their uh, situation. I mean, the dynamic of the economic self-feeling at the micro level, and also the position, I mean, the red line is the position of uh, it's uh, uh, represents the people who think that the economic state got worse. So also I'd like to pay your attention to the last two points. So this is March. I mean, it was at the uh, end of the Soviet period. Uh, um, so this is at the end of March 2020 and uh, this one at the end of March 22. Even before the COVID time and protests, this figure was still less than now. I mean, less people thought that the economic situation uh, was worsening. So I don't know whether uh, we have response to the war, 
or to the economic situation? What is worse for Belarus now, the war or the poverty? That's the question. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andrei. Colleagues, now you can raise your hands or write your questions in the chat. Okay, Andrei Labukin is the first to ask this question. Thank you, Andrei, for such an interesting presentation. It was really very interesting. And I've got an interpretation of I don't know if you think it's uh, relevant, but my interpretation is that Belarusians try to avoid or bypass or uh, hide from the traumatic message about the war going on and uh, being involved in the war as a co-participant country, co-participant uh, involved in the military actions in Ukraine, uh, so they want to hide from that, to step back from the idea of being involved in this kind of traumatic truth or information. And uh, the second point is that, in this sense, they um, they mostly uh, watch uh, Russian TV because uh, this coincides with this idea of them hiding from the uh, war. From so, well, I think uh, there are different people, different attitudes, but in the general trend might be might be like that. So, I think uh, the three slides, the basic geopolitical. Uh, the second, who is to blame for, and uh, the third slide, the participation in the war. So they show what I've said quite clearly. So do you think this is relevant? Do you think my interpretation is uh, correct? Well, Andre, I think this interpretation, of course, has the right to exist. This is kind of internally non contradictive construct. However, it's a beautiful construct, I would say. But uh, what you say, like hiding from this truth, is more characteristic for the Russia, I think, than for Belarus. For Belarus, it's more characteristic. It's not like hiding, but more that they just are not aware of that. They don't know. What is the difference? I mean, that's exactly why I sh showed you the last slide, which is which was not a beautiful slide about the attitude to economic situation. Just to illustrate my idea that. The poverty may be even more frightening for Belarusians than the war itself. Hiding is characteristic for Russia. For Belarus, a different process. I mean, being not aware of or not knowing. Look, when we measure the public opinion in Russia, I mean, public opinion on the war. So, you know that they use the term special operation. What is a special operation? Special operation is something short term uh, on a small scale, and uh, it's like uh, using high-precision weapons to destroy on the military facilities. This is freeing the Ukrainian folk from a small number of uh, Nazis who occupied uh, the power, etc. So this is kind of a white, soft 
simulated, simulated construct, media construct, which is uh, the basis of the answers of Russian respondents when we do service. And uh, that's exactly why we get such big numbers, 72 to 73%. And in this sense, Russian respondents, they hide from this uh, terror of uh, compartments, deaths, I don't want even to pronounce words. So what's happening there is there is happening what we can call uh, the kingdom of protective mechanisms. If during the Crimea it was uh, the kingdom of or reign of compensatory mechanisms, uh, so we have bad roads, but the Crimea is ours. So now it's reign of protective mechanisms. So the bombardment, they are not bombing, not uh, civil population, but or even if they are shooting, they are shooting at uh, Nazis. And even if uh, we bomb uh, the civil population, it's Nazis who wear the clothes just of civil people, but they are really Nazis, they are military men. So in Belarus, people just don't know about that. There, are, there is much less information incoming about the war through mass media. They don't know, that's why they do not respond. But they respond to the economic reality, which is coming not through the mass media, but with the mass media channel, but through individual direct uh, experience that people get and uh, economic information it's coming and they can analyze it and the information about the war is coming also as well but uh, much less of that so that's why uh, I can put accents on what you've said as a follow-up Andrei, what you've said I think it's in the, in the first case, like uh, what you said about Russia, it's kind of substitution of reality. So active uh, propaganda, which reconstruct the image of the war in Russia. When it creates from the war, the special operation, uh, they even banned to use the word war, it's substitution one image of the war with a more comfortable or convenient image of a special operation. This is not hiding, but this is proactively creating the new reality for ourselves. For our, in, in our conscious, using the mass media set. So, in case of Belarus, so there is something different because Belarus, you say, they don't get information. Because you said that on the one hand, Belarusians are quite uh, critical, able to analyze through the three um, scientific institutions, academic institutions, uh, etc., what you've mentioned. But uh, I think Belarusians just don't want to receive this information because it's traumatic psychologically. And uh, this I see as a position to hide, to uh, hide yourself from uh, this traumatic information. And this is the main difference. The Belarusians do not create proactive image, but at the same time they don't see this. Uh, and um, the second comment of yours is correct, I think. Uh, the war is going on somewhere else, I mean, in another country, but the economic consequences are here in my pocket, in my wallet. And I think this interpretation is quite right. So we are not now just uh, thinking of that, but still, I think that sociology is not 
not only figures but interpretation as well and uh, that's why well as far as the economic reality is concerned yes you just uh, reiterate it uh, what i said but just in different words right so there is some coincidence in interpretation yes as far as the protection or compensation is concerned look any compensation is some form of protection and uh, any protection is some form of compensation so there is no pure reason for anything in neither of social phenomena so always we have number of reasons and in this case we just compare the weight of this compensatory part and of this protection part well here we can actually slide move slides and uh, assess the effect of weight of different factors depending on our personal uh, understanding of, of that but i think both things work both compensation and protection now i give the floor to uh, mr uh you host anyway you uh, earlier introduced uh, the concept of uh, ga a gap which is uh, related to the uh, attitude of Belarusians and the Russian people to uh, Crimea annexation etc and you also said you mentioned that uh, less Belarusians approved of this uh, annexation of Crimea than in Russia now when we look at the question and responses to who is to blame for Russia US Ukraine so it's well we can say that the difference uh, between the service made in russia and belarus the results are quite different so this gap between uh, the attitudes of russian people and belarusian people is still quite big so i mean in 2014 and 2015 so there the position of Belarusians was that we were peacemakers and uh, also uh, Belarusians received information not only from Belarusian mass media and Russian mass media but also from Ukrainian mass media but now the fact that uh, the missiles are coming not only from Russia but from Belarus it also affects the opinion but the gap i mean this gap between the opinion of russian and Russian people it stays more or less the same do you agree uh, thank you thank you for your question so i think uh, the the gap concept was introduced in 2014 uh, in regard to the comparison between the response of the public to Crimea and also at that time in Russia uh, the positive attitude to that was about 91-92% of people of respondents and in Belarus this was around 64-66% well and uh, the idea sprang at that time that we have to introduce this gap concept and uh, the second thing is that this gap it stresses that um, i mean we can compare it with the ukrainian public with their opinion so they have completely different attitude to what's going on and in belarus we have just a gap but more or less the same trend and this is kind of an average or, or kind of middle trend 
and it uh, persists, and we have new and new indicators that uh, prove that. So we have this constant. But what is the reason? Is it that the media landscape is the same, uh, however it changed since 2014, or are these basic cultural differences? I mean, Belarus is not Russia, and Belarusians are not Russians. They perceive uh, world information in different way. So what is the reason? Do you think? Well, again, I can repeat that this comparison was done with Ukraine, and uh, there this completely different opinion was uh, because, first of all, they have different life, they have a war, Belarus doesn't have war, and also uh, at the time of Crimea annexation, uh, the Crimea was taken from Ukraine, not from Belarus. So these are different uh, media landscapes as well. And uh, these reasons uh, persist. Different media landscape and uh, different life experience, individual experience. And all these things are closer to Ukrainians than to Belarusians. And that's because it's, we have uh, in Belarus not the opposite opinion to Russia, but just a different trend, but more or less the same opinion. The majority thinks same as in Russia. And uh, the bunch of these factors, of these reasons, they still are there. That's why they're working in the same way. Thank you for your question. Now I will voice several questions from the chat. Um, Andrei, question from Felipe Kanov. So the distribution of non-weighted and weighted data speaks of the fact that maybe you didn't get through to the most rigid or conservative respondents. And one more question. So do you think somebody was missing? Maybe some group of population is not represented, is underrepresented in this survey? Well, we couldn't get through. I mean, uh, well, uh, was that that you couldn't get through or you couldn't call the most rigid or conservative respondents? Well, conservative respondents is very easy to call. I mean, because a conservative person is quite clear reference points in the world and he's ready to talk about them. He's very clear about that. He will respond to your questions. This is not a person who is not oriented, he, who doesn't have this position, but this is very different. It's very easy to actually to ask him a question and to get through to him. And the second part of the question was, what was that? Uh, is anybody missing in the sampling? Maybe somebody is underrepresented in this survey. Well, everyone was represented. In accordance with the social and demographic parameters that exist in the census. And that's what you've seen in which is reflected by the insignificant difference between weighted and non-weighted data. Can I ask you something as a follow-up? Philip, are you going to ask a question? Or what? Can you tell me? So, what were the parameters? Uh, I mean, based on which parameters did you weigh the values, the results? So the sampling, it was weighted on all the parameters. So all the results were weighted. This is how it should be done, actually. 
uh, it should be weighted on all the parameters, even if the factor is small, it's just a standard approach, it's how it should be done, it doesn't matter which method is used. Thank you for your survey, for your presentation. Thank you, Philip. We have another question. So, actually, the survey did not cover uh, the period of um, like events and investigations done in Bucha. Do you think it could affect the survey results if it would cover it? I can assume that, and I think that Bucha really produced some effect. But what was this effect? And especially in percentage, I cannot tell. This is the situation when we can say that it seems to me that the photos from coming from Butcher, they could somehow make some effect. We can, but we'll find it out quite soon if we analyze the attitude to Russia as a whole. Here we have Mr. Vladimir Paniwater in this meeting, and he is uh, raising his hand. He's a very uh, popular Ukrainian sociologist, my colleague. Vladimir, the floor is yours. I have, I had a question. I'm really glad that I had the opportunity to listen to your lecture. This data uh, we received is very important. So these are very important data. And uh, I received calls from journalists asking whether they think relations between Belarusian and the Russian people can be spoiled forever. And uh, I just wanted to ask if there are any data on the attitude to Ukrainian people as well. Unfortunately, I couldn't answer this question, how the attitude to Belarusians changed in Ukraine, because our institute did, no, did not work uh, since the beginning of the war. Now we start to work again step by step. 80% of the population can be covered by our efforts, including those who migrated from Ukraine, moved from Ukraine. And uh, I think we'll start a new Sorry, on the 3rd of May, and we'll include this question about the attitude to Belarusians. Because, uh, of course, in Ukraine, the attitude to Russians is quite clearly formed. And we have. Uh, Ukrainians know that most of Russians support the war in Ukraine, and that's why the attitude to Russians has been clearly formed. And I think uh, it won't change for many years, but Belarusians are different. Attitude to Belarusians is different, and there is different attitude to uh, the government and to the people. And uh, so, in the first survey, the first survey will be done on the paid basis because. We spent quite a lot of money during the two months um, when we didn't work. We had to support our employees. So I think we will uh, mostly do service on the paid basis, not free of charge. But if it will be possible, I will include your question about the attitude to Belarusians and about the question whether the attitude of Belarusians uh, to Ukrainians changed. So I see both a uh, quite high level of sympathy 
with Ukrainians, but also quite high level of support to what Russia does them. So I think we got a new research structure which measured the attitude of Ukrainians to Russians. And the wording of the question was like, do you think that this is one people, Russians and Ukrainians? I will send you later. Do you think that Russian people and Ukrainian people are the same people? And the dynamic was that after a very short period of time, the position no changed by 11 or 12 percent. I mean, the Ukrainian respondents, uh, more Amer uh, Ukrainian respondents answered no, and now 87 percent of Ukrainians don't think that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people. As far as um, the Belarusians are concerned, here again, we'll have uh, this Belarusian gap again, 25%, and soon it will be known. We will find out. We can measure it by Bogardus or, uh, you know, this uh, double or triple peoples. Uh, we can we can try to do it. <coughs> the analysis of like dual people. People's. So our quality survey that we've done in Vitebs region and in Minsk region among all the among the age from 21 to 60 plus in different areas of economic activity. We made one hour interviews with each of the respondents, and we we're saying that almost all the respondents have relatives or friends or acquaintances in Ukraine. And almost all the respondents mentioned that even those who support the what government does, they say that the attitude has changed and they are changing now. And those who do not support the war in Ukraine, those who do not support it, so there are quite a lot of those, and they don't know, they say that I don't know how I later visit Ukraine, look into the eyes of my friends, visit the grave of my parents. So the attitude is very, very different, and the figures, they of course uh, support what Andrei was saying, the, a lot of contradictions uh, in the public opinion, in the public conscience. Yes, now we have a moment in time which is uh, relevant not only to Belarus or Ukraine, it's quite dramatic um, for the relations of Ukraine and Belarus, and the Lord depends on it, and we as sociologists uh, have to monitor that and try to do something in this regard. Well, Vladimir, I think there was quite a specific practical task not to measure the ethnic closeness, or, but we had to squeeze this questionnaire into this military questions. And later we'll have extension of the areas which can be measured related to the questions that you asked, and that's what is going on now, actually. Thank you, Vladimir, for your question. Colleagues, I think we've been talking for almost two hours, so uh, I think there is time only for two questions. So the figures um, for recognition of Lugansk and Donetsk uh, People's Republic is higher than for the Union of Russia and Belarus. Do you think it's connected with fear that uh, Belarusians will experience same things as Ukrainians if we don't enter this union? Well, I think we have to study this uh, issue to find out the empirical reasons. As a hypothesis, I can state 
uh, I once again uh, accentuate this is just my hypothesis that I just came up with right now. So recognition of Lugansk and Donetsk uh, People's Republic by Russia uh, is uh, it's an exterior event and for Belarus it's an interior event and uh, naturally the response to it is kind of higher, negative. Yeah. I mean, so the external it does not really affect us, it's not relevant for us, let them do whatever they want. But recognition of Lugansk and Donetsk Republic by Belarus, that's what we are doing, uh, so we fit it ourselves, and we understand that it can be uh, quite negative. Question from your Berkakust. So do you think it's same gap uh, as we discussed earlier? Yes, yes, it's a very good interpretation. Really, it is. Colleagues, are there any questions? I saw that Yurashina was raising her hand. Well, yeah, uh, but I think my question was answered, in part at least. I'm a journalist from um, Lithuanian, Lithuania, and uh, my question is what actually prevails and how it affects the respondents' answers, whether it is uh, the fear or non-acceptance of the terror of the war. What is working more efficiently now, fear of Russia or non-acceptance or non-tolerance of um, the events, for example, happening in Butcher or cruelty as a whole. So, I, during this period from 15th till 26th uh, March, this survey period, maybe now it's different, especially after Butcher. So, at that time, there was no fear. So, I reiterate that the war at that time was quite an abstract event, which was not directly affecting Belarusian people. Well, okay, we've seen um, some military vehicles, uh, only some people saw it, so it passed through at uh, low speed. Nobody, no soldiers were drinking vodka, they were not approaching women. Uh, running around with uh, machine guns, etc. So nothing actually happened. There was no um, fear. However, you no. Know, if there is no contact, direct your individual contact with something, so the human values uh, they also do not work directly. I don't know whether I can give this example, but for example, if uh, your dog has a sore leg, which your dog is sick. I mean, it can be more important to a person uh, than the special operation in Vietnam. In Vietnam, people died, but your dog is sick, and it's more important to you, you know, because it's your dog, you contact with it. Uh, even if your dog has some kind of minor casualty, like uh, leg fracture, but it's much, much more important than a lot of people dying in Vietnam. You know? So, Andre, do you have a question? Well, yes, great. I'd like to get back once again to the slide where you show this crystallization of the supporters of this basic geopolitical uh, choice. So, I could interpret it. So the number of Belarusians who consider even after one month of war, I mean, joining Union with Russia, so the number of people supporting that, it uh, grew. More people support it. And we see that the proportion between the supporters of uh, integration with the EU and with Russia, so the difference is So, is that an attempt? 
I mean, okay, okay, I will not interpret it myself, but how do you interpret that? So why do you think under the condition of war, still the number of people who see or consider this geopolitical choice, I mean, joining the Russian Federation in some way, not maybe merging to Russia, but joining the Union with Russia in this or that form, why the number of people supporting that grew. So, well, what you are saying, uh, the proportion is uh, two times different. It's quite a standard value, which uh, was always there for many years. And uh, this is the th first thing. And the second thing regarding the war itself. So at that point, when during the uh, survey, uh, the war actually came to the land of Ukraine, and but at that time, it uh, still was not perceived by the Russians. They didn't really get it. They didn't really understand what happened. Uh, that's why it was different. And so at that point. So, um, uh, that's why the uh, response was proportional to uh, what was understood by them, what was uh, perceived by them. But before Bush, uh, people, uh, still Belarusian people, uh, thought that it was a, spe a special operation. But after Bucha, uh, most of Belarusians understood that this is war. So probably this uh, emotional, psychological uh, boundary after which some changes happened. And later there will be some assessments, more negative assessments, uh, both of some specific things like uh, whether we have to recognize Lugansk and Donetsk uh, People's Republic, who is to blame for, and this will be dissolving the general image of uh, Russia, solidified image of Russia. That's what I called uh, the partial breakaway or split off. And one of the possible scenarios uh, as a consequence of that is a worsening of attitude to Russia. So after some time, that can happen. I don't know if I really answered your question. Well, well, one month of war is not two or three days. It's not one week. I think butcher. It was. It's not like war. It's uh, something else. It's uh, an evidence of uh, war crimes, not of war itself, but uh, war crime. So it's non-conventional, same as uh, violence or cruelty or something uh, that breaks the rule of the war, conventional war, or, uh, or for example, like uh, looting. After uh, months of bombardments, uh, we understand that Mariupol was destroyed by one third or even more. There were bombardments there were a lot of evidences of these bombardments, etc. So, and uh, well, this is the first, first thing. And the, the second thing is that the war splits this 24% of those who have not formed the position yet by crystallizing these two main groups uh, for. Uh, joining EU and for joining Russia, two groups. So, and the war is not something extraordinary for 
Belarus because actually the proportion more or less remains the same. This is quite a kind of a constant. And in this sense, we might understand that uh, for Belarusians, the war as a geopolitical choice does, did not become a pivot point for their opinion, but uh, still they are moving in the same trend, but the number of people who are politically active uh, is growing, right? Just, just this is changing, not the general trend. Well, you explained it all by yourself. So, at the first stage of the war, it's what we have is the assessment of the construct, simulative construct, and uh, when you do not see the course of war yourself, what's happening? There is an accumulation of energy within uh, the mentality or perception of the reality. So, for example, uh, now a uh, Russian citizen, what he says, the Ukraine is freed from the Nazis, they are bombing only military facilities, etc. This is uh, the Uh, strengthening of uh, the existing um, concepts based on uh, the reign of justice. So this is about the crystallization of the opinion. This is the first part of your question. And uh, regarding the second part, here we have to separate out or draw our attention to the fact, to the subjective assessment of the uh, time period. When I was a small boy, my father had a um, Moskvich 403, it's an old Soviet car, and I enjoyed driving 100 kilometers per hour so much, it seemed to me the speed limit, so nothing can move faster than that. Now, 100 kilometers per hour you can drive with, you can drink Coca-Cola, talk by phone, like also move something on the seat near you and drive with this speed. Same with time. So one month after the war started for you as the person living in the other informational field, uh, different from um, standard Belarusian citizen, it's a huge period of time. And for a statistical uh, media consumer, I mean this average uh, Belarusian citizen, it's a very short period of time. And this uh, time lag from the event till their response is much less for the expert, for an advanced person, and it's much, much bigger for a layman, for an average media consumer. That's been observed many times, I mean, this re rating response to the default, for example. At uh, the beginning, the economists start saying that there is a recession, end of the world, tomorrow the earth will collapse in many fragments, in many pieces, but the less conscious response uh, in a month, I mean, the rankings change only after a month of recession, not earlier. That's the same effect that we observe now. Thank you, Andre. Uh, for the discussion. Now, the last uh, question from Mr. Yuri Rakakrust, and then we will have to finish with our presentation. Colleagues, I, I, it's not even a question, but it's, I'd like to present one more interpretation that about the phenomena of crystallization of the opinion. Andrei said that but, so, Russia is uh, kind of integrated in uh, our Belarusian soul, in a way, so for many years, is it better now? Sorry, I had some problems with the sound. You get frozen from time to time. Okay, so, so, okay, uh, you can 
send us uh, your question. Well, uh, actually, this question probably was very interesting. I think he was, uh, even before he was mentioned about this crystallization, so maybe, okay, colleagues, we were talking for two hours uh, with Mr. Ray Valdemarski. He presented quite interesting data. After the presentation, I will send uh, the slides to you so that you can use it. So please check our YouTube releases. Uh, colleagues staying in Warsaw, you can come, join us, communicate with the experts, you can join us offline. Thank you those who joined us during this uh, two hours and see you next time.